sales and marketing are the engines of any business at all. They are what are bringing in the money, they are bringing in the new clients, and they are very creative elements. Business of Architecture UK, episode 44. Welcome. Hello. It's Ryan Willard here, host of the Business of Architecture UK. I hope you are all very well. And today's podcast is myself, and I'm going to be speaking about the seven threats to an architectural practice. Now, this is particularly important because the event is happening tomorrow, or um, depending when you're listening to this, but the event called The Seven Threats to an Architecture Practice we've got on is going to be happening live tomorrow. You and I offices, tickets are now on sale. Go and grab the last ones whilst you still can. It happened 5th of March, 7 o'clock. It's going to be amazing. We've got a guest panel speaking, uh, and they will be going on about how they have shaped their practices, their businesses, how they have avoided these seven threats throughout the process of their careers and what lessons they've learned and tools that they employ to make sure that these threats are not eroding away at their profit, their business and their design. So a little bit of background into the seven threats. These have come about as a result of the work that I've been doing last year. So last year I spoke to around 40 odd architects, entrepreneurs, industry thought leaders, and interviewed them about their stories, how they had created their businesses. And again and again and again, there were a, a, an array of similar themes that kept kind of cropping up, particularly when people were talking about their obstacles that they'd overcome or things that they needed to navigate. And it really got me thinking over the Christmas period, I really had a bit of quiet time. I was in North Wales, I was reflecting and listening to some of these podcasts again. And I wanted to distill the seven things that were commonly getting in the way of architects' practices or that all architects end up facing and dealing with throughout the course of their careers. So that's what this list is. And we're gonna jump in to number one. So I'm gonna be looking over here on my screen every so often. Uh, but number one is poor cash flow. Right, so the first threat to a successful, impactful, and profitable architecture business is poor cash flow. Cash flow is king. Now we hear um, the dictum that's banded around about turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash flow is reality. And it really is. It, it, cash flow is the number one reason that any business, let alone architectural businesses, find themselves in trouble. It's even possible for your business to show that you're making a profit over the end of the year, but you might not have any cash. You might have, you might have run out of cash. And you might have a few days, even a few days. It's like not having oxygen or not having blood in your business. Even a few days without cash in the bank can be absolutely horrendous. Um, I've heard crazy stories of property developers. I remember there was a guy, I think it's Martin Skinner, who's now the... Um, CEO of Inspired, an incredible, incredible man, incredible story. And he talks about in the 2008 recession, one of his earlier property ventures, how um, they'd borrowed to the tune of five million pounds or something, something along that lines. And the banks quickly had like a 24 hour recall um, clause in the loan, in the, in the payment loan conditions. Um, and they called in the loan and he had to, they had to get 5,000, 5 million pounds in cash back to the bank and they weren't able to do it and it meant that they ended up going bankrupt. So cash is like a body, you know, a, a business without cash in it is like a body with no blood. So what is cash flow? How do we define it? Cash flow is the money flowing in and out of your business at any given time. Um, and although it does seem that cash flows only one way out of the business, it does actually flow both ways. And it's really important to understand that architecture, for example, has a long and complex sales cycle. And if we don't understand that cash flow cycles in our architecture businesses and effectively manage them, it can create and compound all sorts of cash flow issues. We know architecture is a slow business. Projects can last for years and years and years, taking months and months for each design stage. We know that they can often take way longer than you might be expecting on a project, particularly if you're doing something in planning, 
time scales can shift. And again, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why, business reasons why that should never happen and why, as architects, we need to be in control of that. Um, but if you're not billing periodically, you're going to have problems. Um, or if you don't bill up front and take an up front payment and you, you wait until all the work is complete before billing, that's going to be very, very harsh on your cash flow. Um, and it's likely that you're going to have other expenses to settle from other consultants, from employees, from your rent, which will be coming out on a regular monthly basis. So cash flow is king. And if a client is late with your payments as well, this is one of the things that Johan and I have spoken about on many a podcast. If a client is late with your payments, this can lead to that feast and famine cycle. This can lead to compounding any existing cash flow problems that you might be experiencing and it really can cripple a business so in the conversations and negotiations that we have with our clients having those robust upfront uncomfortable conversations about finance about money about payment about payment deadlines this can start to protect your cash flow. I remember Johan telling me in the podcast how when he goes into any business, the first thing he starts to look at is the profit and loss statements um, and their balance sheets. And it never ceases to amaze him how many unclaimed, unpaid invoices can be sitting within a business and a company is not wanting to uh, upset the client or upset the relationship. Um, but that leaves this huge period of time where there's no money coming in and money is, you know, you're not a bank. These businesses, as business people, we are not banks, unless that's what you set out to be. That's another, that's a whole other conversation. Um, and ultimately, cash flow is a result of your sales and your pipeline activity. So if there's not enough sales coming in, if you don't have enough clients, if you're not networking, if you don't have any kind of structured referral systems that are bringing in a constant supply of new clients, or you have referral systems which are able to tap into your existent client database uh, and either have them give you further work or be referring them on to you on to their peers and contemporaries and other colleagues, cash flow is going to have a problem. Um, so there you go. That's number one, poor cash flow. Number two, number two, number, the second threat to an architecture practice is lack of resource. Now, I've broadly categorize the three types of resource into money and capital, time, and staff. But really, money and capital is, again, it is the most important one. And there are different ways of looking at time and of, st and of staff. But money and capital, if you get those, if you can start getting money and capital right, the other two can help. So, most businesses, they end up failing due to a lack of financial resource. And if it's a new business, particularly if it's run by someone for the first time, and they say you've taken out all your personal, or maybe you've been saving for a few years and you've got 20, 30,000 pounds put aside, fantastic. Um, but it's very common that that kind of saving, even the amount of that kind of savings is not enough. Uh, particularly if you make mistakes and you end up spending a lot of money on something it doesn't work or you invest in some kind of marketing strategy and then there's nothing returned. I remember when I was in the first parts of my business, um, I dropped a few thousand pounds onto various types of advertisements that just didn't pay any dividends at all. You just That was it. Not that I didn't get the service, that was our thought, it was just not allocated in the right direction and it wasn't the right thing that my business needed to be doing in order to provide more um, to get more clients so when we're running out of resource in our businesses the first thing that ends up getting affected is sales and marketing and arguably sales and marketing are the most important aspects of a business this is why I've fallen in love with these two aspects of a business even more so than design in many ways um, Sales and marketing are the engines of any business at all. They are what are bringing in the money, they are bringing in the new clients, and they are very creative elements. So without any financial resource, you can't put anything into those businesses, into those elements, those systems of your business, and it ends up not producing more work, and the business will end up stalling. Um, lack of financial resource also makes us reactive. 
We end up getting desperate. We end up taking on the wrong types of clients. We end up lowering our fees. We end up, um, I think, you know, taking on the wrong types of clients. I mean, I hear two schools of thought. So Oliver Solway the other day in the interview was saying that at the beginning of a project, at the beginning of a company, you take on any kind of work. And there's an element of truth to that. And, you, you know, I did that when I first started taking on any, any kind of projects. But when you're in a position of poor financial resource and you end up taking on projects, particularly ones where you've, um, you've negotiated too low a fee and it's really not the type, right type of person that you should be working on, um, and those can last for long periods of time. They can end up lasting for two, three years at sometimes, and obviously longer. And that will end up having an impact on your business, and it will end up preventing you from taking on other types of projects and other types of work that is the right kind of work. So the other part of lack of resources, time. This can be a huge one for every entrepreneur, any architect running his or her own business. Lack of time will quickly make your business feel like an uphill struggle. Your lack of time will quickly learn to burn out, stress, low levels of productivity, and it's just not fun. And there's lots of reasons why. We'll talk about that a little bit later under the, the, one of the other threats. But time, we're not, if we haven't got enough time in our businesses and we're not, or we're putting our time into the wrong efforts and energies, um, that can have a massive, massive impact and can end up eroding away and depleting staff morale We've all worked for companies where you've been doing midnight, 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 again and again and again. It doesn't help anybody. Um, the other lack of resources, staff and human resource, of course. So not having the right team in place to deliver projects or win new work will create a very difficult environment for a business to grow. And this is interesting because I think at every stage of a business, a business will face this challenge. So the nature of growing a business is all of a sudden you're growing, you've got more work on, and then you suddenly find yourself out of balance with the amount of staff that you have. Um, I've certainly experienced this when I've won a load of work. Woohoo, brilliant. And then I've got to find people to do the work or outsource it and, and things like that, and that can cause its own, that has its own kind of growing pains, if you like. Uh, or what many entrepreneurs end up doing is trying to do everything themselves, which only ends up leading to burnout that ends up kind of ends up putting a kind of a lid on how much actually that you can that you can do um so not delegating i remember chatting to jamie sarah uh one of the uh, business coaches the global success coaches before christmas and she said that not delegating or outsourcing work that isn't high income value is can be one of the most one of the largest money blocks for for entrepreneurs for business people for architects so that's number two. I also I put together a little business resource analysis tool for that, um, which I will make available to you. But that's a, it's a good little resource. It's like a little star diagram that you can look at and you can allocate, you can look at different points on the star for different elements of your business and you can allocate one to 10 of where you think you are and it gives you a kind of little snapshot of where you think the lacks of resources might be and allows you to be systematic in which ones to address first. Um, I find that very useful because otherwise, again, particularly in the early stages of business, when everything is, seems like there's not enough of it, um, there are certain key ones to be focusing on. Number three, no market need. Now this can be a harsh one. This can be one that is quite hard to understand and I use myself as an example here um, I use myself as an example always I have I have good experience with all of these business uh, threats and challenges and when I set up my own architecture practice so number three no market need all right so when I set up my own architecture practice I was ready to start ready to start designing buildings that kind of continued on from my master's thesis work so I did a thesis which was all about how architecture can facilitate hypnotic and trance-like states of consciousness. And I won't go into it in here. It was fascinating stuff. However, translating that kind of design aspirations or design interests into a commercially viable business took a long time. And obviously, I didn't walk out into university and suddenly find all these people that wanted to have buildings that put them into hypnotic trances or kind of facilitated higher shamanistic states of mind. That was not really, 
you know, not really around. I'm sure there are some people. Uh, and to be fair, one of the projects I did end up working on very early in my, in my business was a Buddhist monastery. So that's pretty, you know, they're all into meditation and contemplative spaces. But I, I did find it very challenging to find similar types of projects. And particularly I worked on that one as a, as a pro bono project because of my, you know, my personal commitment to, um, to, that, to that kind of work and personal transformation. Um, but finding other types of projects that were, were wanting me, where I could experiment and play with ideas of introspective contemplative spaces and you know, reduced uh, sensory experiences, it wasn't easy. And to try and lead with that as well, to try and lead with that in my marketing communication of like, here's what I do, I do these kind of spaces, it just wasn't fulfilling any kind of market need. Uh, and it was all about me. And, you know, after months of sparse projects and random planning applications here and there and, you know, ultimately very little money in the bank, I had this kind of epiphany that was, that set me free. No one cared. Absolutely nobody cared. And actually, when I, when I understood that, it was very, very freeing because I realized that I had to change and get into the listening of my client and understand what it was that they wanted to be doing, what, they, what were their pains, what were the emotional drivers behind their projects, what was it that was really under the skin, and that was, you know, why do people want to spend uh, half a million pounds on extending their house, or however much, you know, whatever kind of project it is. Um, Mies van der Rohe said, never talk to a client about architecture. He will not understand what you have to say about architecture most of the time. And an architect of ability should be able to tell a client what he wants. Most of the time, a client never knows what he wants. So in that, I would um, unpack it a lot, a little bit as well. And I think it's a great quote. And you're the architect. You are the one that's providing the design. You're the one that's providing the architecture. You just have to be able to articulate and communicate what you're doing solves their problem, solves their need. And as long as the designer is always addressing that, because you as a designer, you as an architect, we are always selling our design ideas. All three, it's not just happening once, it happens throughout the entire relationship um, of design proposals. We are always selling that. And particularly, there's different people in different parts of the construction process, but the, for the client, they've got their own specific problem. So we need to know that what that is, understand it, understand it emotionally, because sometimes it might be irrational to us, or you know, it's always logical for the, other, for the other person, but we need to be able to understand all the complexity and the richness and the, the emotional driver that's having somebody do that. It doesn't matter what kind of client they are, if it's a domestic private residential to um, a developer type of clients, because developers and clients, they've got personal things happening in their businesses and personal reasons why they want to have a project successful. And us as architects, us as salespeople, it's our job to listen and to find out and to explore and to discover what is the most important thing to our clients and communicate to that all the time. Once we know that, that is the beginnings of great marketing. It's the way that we can start to differentiate our practices from other practices, and it sets us apart from other types of uh, other, other architects and makes us very unique. So I did a little exercise in one of the emails that I sent out, which was, what, which was all about finding your niche. And I think this, is, this kind, of, kind of comes on from that. Um, and a niche market. So a lot of us, when we think about niche markets, we might think that it's something that we choose or we select. So we might think, oh, great, you know, I'm going to do an architecture practice that specializes in doing, you know, an architect might say something like water-based buildings or buildings that always interact on the edge between, the dynamic edge between um, coastal regions and the shifting landscapes, which is a beautiful architectural proposition and idea. But in terms of um, selling and marketing and being for a client need, you're going to struggle to, to actually translate that into something else. So niches tend to be, well, they're discovered, they're found or they're uncovered. And I've spoken a lot about this on some of my other posts elsewhere about 
emergent strategies, how lots of the best businesses often find their services through being very aware of the market, being very attentive to the needs and the problems uh, of their clients that they're serving and their offerings end up evolving and changing to suit that. It's rarely kind of propositional in the sense of like, here's what we're going to do. Um, and then, you know, you put all that resource into developing a product that nobody cares about, nobody wants. So this is really, this is very, very deep. Um, and there's a great piece here I've got from Eben Pagan, and he's written a thing called the Niche Intelligence Report. So if you get hold of that, check it out. It's really, really interesting. And he talks about how the word niche uh, the etymology of the word niche originally meant a shallow recess, especially one in a wall to display a statue or ornament. And in biology, the word niche is used to describe a place in a natural ecosystem where a particular animal or organism is perfectly suited. So statues fill niches in walls, animals fill niches in ecosystems, but more importantly, products fill niches in markets. So... And he defines a market niche as a need many people have that your product fills. So the process of targeting a niche and finding a need that people are having then creating or finding a product to solve it is one of the first things that stops people from even starting businesses because they're unable to find or target a good niche. So this is all, you know, this finding your market need, not doing this kind of exercise and continually, it's not just once that you do it, it has to be done again and again and again. And again, from my own personal experience um, in my businesses, um, I've started off very much having projects which are about me and doing things that I wanted to do to then finding out, um, you know, actually, what, what kind of things can I do? I can still get my own design narratives and my own design um, elements into projects and my own design styles but when I engage with the clients I'm very much more about what is it that they're specifically looking for um, you know I might market myself uh, as someone who specializes with listed buildings after I did the monastery after I've done pro projects in um, you know very nice places in in West London um, working on listed listed structures it's a particular niche kind of uh, element which will lead to more of that kind of kind of work and also location. Location is also a great, a great niche. But there's a, there's, a lot, there's a lot more depth to this than that as well. And you can really start to explore and find, uh, you know, particular solution problems. And I think architects are good at this. You know, when we're developing our own projects at university, we, we start to imagine products and problems and solutions and people. Um, and this just needs... The same thing, it's just really out there in the world and we need to be getting constant feedback from our marketplace. So I could do another podcast all on just that actually, so I will do that at one point. Number four, discounting to win work. Now, I'm all for strategic and financial planning with your offers. I remember Joe Cowan of Joe Cowan Architects in her interview with me, she shared how she postponed her fees for planning until after they got planning because she knew that the developers, once there was planning permission granted on the site, their liquidity financially was a lot more abundant, shall we say. It was much easier for them to get the final sign-off for investors and for people to start chucking in the money towards those developments because there was a certain degree of certainty about the viability of that project. So she was very aware of that. And particularly when she was doing smaller projects and she wanted to make that leap into doing larger scale uh, projects, she was able to um, propose deals and offerings to those developers that would say, okay, I'm going to postpone the fees until after planning. Um, that made her very attractive. She was also able to use some of her existing clients as potential investors and bring that as a kind of, you know, another set of assets and capital as a proposal to a client but that's not discounting that's that's being strategic and it's very different the, the the discounting that I'm talking about is particularly when you are in I mean the worst kind is when you're when you get driven down in price 
And if you're getting driven down on price in a conversation, there's something that's gone wrong in the first place about you shouldn't be talking to that person, um, how you've been marketing yourself, the ways, the kinds of people that you've been uh, getting into your, into your sphere and the way that you've been selling. And if you haven't got your market need right um, and you're selling on features and benefits and talking about how you know great gutter details you do, and I know you don't do that, obviously. That's something that I would do. But... Uh, you know, however you might be proposing your architectural ideas to a client and you get into this conversation where they're kind of pushing you down on price and you just slash a load of um, fees off it, you end up being on the back foot. And there's, it, it, when you discount your offer, the conversation automatically just turns to price. And it's different. It's different from negotiating. If you're going to give some of your price away as fees get it back some some other kind of way you have it that you everything gets to pay, be paid up front or that you get another service in return if you're going to discount over there there's got to be that's negotiating that's bartering there's that's different to just getting on the back foot and and cutting your prices or even just discounting your price because you really 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 want that project okay sometimes there might be a loss leader of a project sometimes Sometimes, but I wouldn't have that as a as a strategy, uh, and I really think that discounting. Once you've discounted once, you've it will impact the rest of your business. Um, it makes it painful for you. Once you've agreed to a, a fee that's too low, you have to deliver on that project, and that is not always easy, uh, and that can be very very difficult. And it will impact other elements of your company as well, which can be. Very, very difficult, and it can instantly stunt a lot of growth. Also, when you feel like you're not being fairly remunerated for your work um, in, and you're not on top of your emotions, you haven't got the emotional intelligence to be aware of that kind of frustration, you know, resentment can build up, anger, and it can slowly erode away at the relationship that you have with that client, which will make the project even harder and more money and time will end up being lost. So discounting. Big, 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 big threat to your business. So be warned about that. Lack of leadership, number five. So lack of leadership, I've broken this one down into two elements. That's, this is the leadership of others and the leadership of yourself. And for me personally, self-leadership is the most important thing. It's the most important one out of all of these, really, personally. I will always say that personal development, self-leadership, self-inquiry, self-awareness, emotional intelligence, these are the most important assets that we can ever develop as human beings. And it might seem at first that they are not paying any dividends, but they will shape the quality of your everyday life experience, the quality of your communication, your ability to get in front of people that matter to you, your ability to be able to make an impact and significant difference to anybody, anywhere, anytime. Self-leadership, emotional intelligence, personal growth, personal development, that is all at the very, very root of everything. Because when you have those types of skills, you start making different decisions and you're able to take risk, and you're able to weather the kind of ups and downs that business, just the natural path of business is ups and downs. You get slapped in the face one day, and then you get a pat on the back on the other. It's just, nat it's just part and parcel of the game. Um, so self-leadership, without self-leadership, you're not able to lead other people. And you might end up becoming a bottleneck in your own business. Now, I've, I've experienced this. I've in the past where workflows, decision-making, the completion of numerous tasks have all ended up depending on me. And on the surface of it, there's this kind of false sense of control and importance. But on the other side, this behavior can slowly suffocate a business. And uh, again, Jamie, Sarah said this, the refusal to delegate and empower others to take ownership can really strangle your business. And this and, and then leadership, and it will affect the results and the ability of your business to actually grow and expand. Um, being busy versus being productive, I think this kind of comes into the self-leadership and leadership conversation that there really is no such thing as time management. Time is ultimately a human perception of experience. Uh, I won't go into the philosophical natures of that now. Again, we could sit here for hours and talk about that but 
rather than managing time, we need to learn and manage and lead ourselves. Uh, and we need to lead ourselves into doing the things that are the most effective and important. And we need to lead ourselves to take action, even when we do not want to take action. So it's that tremendous discipline that high-performing people master that leads them on to extraordinary results, from athletes to people in the military to people in business to artists to academics, all sorts of high-performing people. This self-discipline is what leads to extraordinary levels of performance. Um, there is also a difference between being a boss and being a leader. Now, a boss will try and get to people to do stuff either by coercion, persuasion, uh, convincing, threats, micromanaging, uh, and other kinds of negotiating tactics, and some can be more effective than others. But there's a significant limit to where this kind of management can go, and results will end up growing slowly. A boss will try and force things and manipulate things and will be coming from a very top-down position or authority and perhaps might use fear, threats. Um, we all know, we've all had that, we've all, had, we've all worked for bosses that have tried to do that to us and we may have even tried to do that with other people and got frustrated and not understood why we're having such limited results in the effective leadership of other people. But what leaders do is they create other leaders. They see and are present to their own personal leadership and they see that in others, even when those other people are not present to themselves. And a leader will understand that a team is made of individuals who each have their own personal goals. They've all, they've all got their own missions in life for accomplishing their work. And a good leader knows and understands this very intimately and they're able to communicate to their individual team member's personal mission. As a great leader will be able to listen and find out what's important to that person. Some people it might be money, some people it might be acknowledgement, some people it might be just great doing great design work, it might be the excitement of, some, of them, something, it might be responsibility. Everyone's got something different that makes them buzz, right? Some people it might be security, long-term planning, et cetera, et cetera, and a mix of all of those. And as a leader, it's our responsibility to listen for what is most important to that person, communicate to that, and be able to have them enrolled in their own personal mission in their life. Um, Ken Blanchard and Paul Hershey in their book, uh, Management of Organizational Behavior, called this type of leadership situational leadership. And it goes deep. It goes very, very deep. And I think that lack of leadership in a business can really start to have companies going off the rails, going in the wrong direction, and causing a lot of pain. Number six, fear of selling. So I'm gonna ask you a question. What is the oldest profession in humanity? Have a think. And I'm pretty sure whatever answer pops into your head is in fact a form of sales. So number six is fear of selling, right? Now, as a human being, we are always selling something or we are being sold something from ideas, beliefs, suggestions to consumer products and services. Selling is human communication. Effective selling is effective communication. Um, and everybody is a salesperson. And we have a very kind of societal image of what a salesperson is. But selling is an art form. And when it's done, when done properly, it can be the quickest way to resolve pretty much any kind of business problem that a company has. And selling, and I'm including marketing in this part of the conversation because selling is uh, marketing is is part of the sales process. These are the most important parts of any businesses. If we are running any kind of organization or business, sales and marketing, sales and marketing, sales and marketing have got to be at the forefront of your mind. Um, all the entrepreneurs that I've ever spoken to are masterful salespeople. They are masterful marketeers. They understand that level of communication. They understand the client needs. They understand how to communicate to that. They understand and they listen incredibly well. 
Um, and I was saying earlier, you know, we when we immediately think of salespeople, we think of dodgy, shifty, used cow salespeople, or those irritating cold calls that you get that interrupt you in the middle of the day, and you're like, yeah, what? And then uh, they ask you some banal set of questions and you're like, well, hold on a minute, where did you get my number from? And they were like, um, we got it off some certain websites. And it's just unpleasant, right? It's just this kind of irritation. And we end up making a connection to that kind of experience and actual sales. And I think that's rather unfortunate and not accurate and not at all what it is uh, that sales is actually about. And most people end up thinking about sales as selling, uh, as convincing a customer to buy something. And at the end of the day, nobody wants to be convinced. Nobody likes having anyone convince them. It's horrible, it's exhausting, and it causes the fear. And the fear of selling, we've all got to do this bit of introspection to try and understand what our fear of selling is. It could be the fear of rejection. It could be the fear of not being liked. It could be the fear of being perceived as pushy or that our product won't deliver results. We're actually just concerned that we are selling crap. Um, and that will prevent us from getting in front of the right types of people to be selling our products. Uh, professional selling is listening. Professional selling is about understanding the client. People love to buy. They hate being convinced. They hate being sold to. Professional selling is listening to your customer, deeply understanding their pains and the emotional drivers for their projects. And the most important part of selling and marketing and of business in general is getting in front of your prospective customers yourself. Because when you're in front of your customers yourself, you can ask them questions. You can pick their brains. You can find out what's making them tick. It doesn't matter what you're selling, but the more time you invest interacting with prospective customers and asking them about their needs and their height, the higher your chances of success. And the key to selling and marketing is, again, understanding those needs. So I had a, little, uh, I had a little list of a lot of different resources, which was, at, was in one of the emails. So if you want to hear that, let me know. Send me an email, and I'll send you the list of books and great podcasts uh, to, do with <clears throat> to do with selling. So the last one, the final one, the last threat to an architecture business is number seven, losing talent. Now, losing talent, replacing talent can be a massively disruptive and expensive process for any business and in today's culture job loyalty apparently is more fleeting and we think of younger staff as you know finding uh, find faster ways to progress in their career by moving dum 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 from company to company and they can jump and uh, and that may have some truth in it and you know it is it is less commonplace that people spend years and years and years at businesses however employees will rarely leave a company unless they feel like growing, uh, unless they feel like they're growing or they're being challenged or they're, you know, they're valued and being rewarded. And uh, last week's podcast, actually really interesting with um, Finn Harper, and he was asking the question about, well, how can companies be responsible for ensuring the well-being and the growth aspirations of their employees? And how can education begin to prime our students to be great employees where they are actually um, taking on these as part of their responsibilities? How can we be a great architect, uh, you know, one of the, you know, a great, great practitioner and work for somebody else? And I think, you know, there's a few reasons why talented people end up leaving architecture practices. Um, one is there's just a complete lack of career development. There's, it sounds obvious, but there's no visible progression for an employee. They're going to find it somewhere else and they're going to go. Um, and I think that can kind of, in, in architecture specifically, it can be about design. And I think a lot of tans people want to be able to flex their design muscles and they want to be able to really go into some incredible projects and do beautiful things. And if they're not getting that kind of fulfillment out of their work, they're going to leave. Uh, another reason why talent leaves is that they're not connected to the company vision in any kind of way. Your company has not been explaining what it is you're up to, that you don't know what the bigger picture is, and the staff will disconnect and end up feeling like a cog in a machine. I used to work for Roger Stark Harbors and Partners, and Richard Rogers, I think, is one of the masters. A, he's a master leader. He was amazing at being able to make 
you know, to see the leadership in other people. And he was also masterful in being able to communicate very clearly the company vision and ethos on a repetitive way and build a very distinct company culture, which made people very, very proud to be part of that company. And it was no surprise that there is many, many people that at that business who have been there for 20 years plus. Like it was extraordinary to walk around that place um, and see that amount of, of staff. And that's, and that's partly, I, I think, because the vision was so clear and the way the vision was communicated was very powerful. Um, one of the other reasons why talent leaders is because you as the boss or the leader, the business owner, is not connected to your employee's vision. Not everyone's going to feel the same way that you do about your business. So being able to know, we spoke about this in the last one, the leadership, but know what somebody else's vision is for their life and for their career, that makes a big difference. And if, if a talent, you know, your staff knows that you're listening to that and really is genuinely concerned about it and you're creating a specific pathway for them to fulfill in that, they're going to stay around. They're going to stay around for a long time and they're going to be very, very loyal. Lack of acknowledgement. Genuinely acknowledging somebody is a powerful tool in creating relationships. Um, and I'm not talking about sort of, I'm not talking about false compliments and flattery to kind of give people, you know, a lift to get them to do something for you, but genuinely picking out little moments where somebody has done some great work or even just how someone is being in the face of something very challenging. I think that can be a very powerful way of acknowledging somebody and having a conversation and be like, look, I, I saw how you handled that client just now, that was a really difficult situation and they were coming down really hard on you and you had a lot of things on your plate and I really, you know, the way that you did that with ease and grace and I know that you got a bit upset but, um, you know, and you came to me and you told me, um, you know, that was, you, you told me the problems and we got it sorted out and I really respect that. That kind of stuff goes a long way with, with, um, with, uh, with, with people. I was, I was working with somebody and I made a mistake uh, about something and I told I immediately told the people I hear I've made this mistake this and this and this here's the impact that it's had um, and here's what I put in place to to um, to make sure that it doesn't happen again and I'm, you know it's quite straight matter of fact and the person I was working with it came and had a conversation with me and said you know what I really appreciate that you said that and that you did that that means the world to me that you that you communicated like that in that kind of manner and I was like Wow, that is amazing. I just got, I got filled with excitement about it. So, you know, and you've got to be able to listen for what kind of things, what types of acknowledgement people really respond to. But acknowledgement is very, very powerful. Um, and the final one, why people are going to leave, is because of low pay, no benefits, and a high workload. See how that works. We've all been there. We've all been paid, you know, as architects, less than we will, maybe we, we would desire, um, perhaps not working on the right projects, and then you're, the nights are becoming longer and longer and longer, and that lifestyle ends up impacting every element of somebody's life, and it will end up making people leave your business. So that's all from me. Do not forget that tomorrow night, the 5th of March, and if you're listening to this after the 5th of March, I'm sorry, it's over, it's finished, but we're going to be discussing these seven threats in more depth on the night. I look forward to seeing you there. Tickets are on sale now. Go and click in the link in the information of whatever format you're listening to this to. And I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.